as you know, covers in large part the, I guess you'd say the beginning in earnest of the reign of David. You know, 1 Samuel ends with Saul and Jonathan dying in battle, 1 Samuel chapter 31. And 2 Samuel kind of, well, it, not kind of, it picks up right where this leaves off, <clears throat> right where 1 Samuel left off. And so Saul was struck in battle against the Philistines back in chapter 31. And uh, Saul is one of those, if you look at 1 Samuel 31 and verse 4, he is one of those occasions of suicide in the Bible. He fell on his own sword. Well, as you, so as you open the book of 2 Samuel, that Saul's died, chapter 1, verse 1, and uh, this, this man comes running to David with, with quite a story that he has put Saul to death. And I... I tried to figure out why. I mean, I, I don't know that we're necessarily told precisely in the text. The only reason that I could come up with is that he wants some kind of, I don't know, maybe recognition for being so brave as to, as to do what the king asked him to do because he tells the story that, well, Saul, Saul asked me to and, and so I did it. And so one of the phrases then we see David using, and it's used throughout 1 Samuel too. I went, I went back and circled it. Particularly, it's used by David, uh, referring to Saul as the Lord's anointed. And that's, that's how David always refers to Saul. And that's so interesting to me because, I mean, how many, on how many occasions has Saul tried to kill David? And yet, David, on at least two occasions in 1 Samuel, has an opportunity to literally stab, Dave, uh, stab Saul in the back, and he doesn't do it. And it's amazing that to, to see David's actions. So one time, Saul goes into a cave to relieve himself, and David's hiding in the cave. And remember, he cut off the corner of his robe. And then on another occasion, they, uh, Saul and his army are asleep out in the field, and David sneaks up and takes his... Takes what, his water jug and his spear or something like that and then flees. And so on two occasions, he could have just ended it. And he didn't because Saul was the Lord's, the Lord's anointed. And that's, that's what he was. I mean, Saul's not a good man whatsoever. And then, so I was thinking about that as I was reading 1 Samuel last week and 2 Samuel, well, 1 Samuel two weeks ago and 2 Samuel this week. And I just got to thinking, and this was me. So you got somebody hunting you down for years who throws spears at you trying to kill you, trying to pin you to the wall, as one text says. Uh, and, and David repeatedly refuses to do anything against the Lord's anointed. And I thought, you know, that's, we need that more today in Christians. Because we'll get mad at each other and we won't even talk to each other. And it's not like somebody's trying to kill me. We'll just, we'll get upset with something somebody does or says and we'll just, that's, I'm done. And we'll be rather, well, I would say childish sometimes because we didn't get treated the way we felt we should get treated or whatever the case may be. And you got somebody here literally hunting somebody down and yet he, he behaves the way he does. So this guy comes from the battle. I've, I, put, I put Saul down. And like I said, I can't think but that he wanted some type of recognition. And uh, of course, he's rebuked for what he did. And, and uh, David destroys him because he struck the Lord's anointed. So this book, 2 Samuel, traces from that point, from the end of Saul to David's reign. So the key thoughts in the book are just that. It's all about that, his reign, the growth of his kingdom and his power. And, but, but also we get a pretty good window into, into David's personal life, which is rather, I would say, disturbing. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of talk about that. Key characters, of course, David. Joab, this is the commander of David's army. And Joab is 
you, you can't get more faithful to David than Joab, but Joab is not a good man. And, and there are even times when he bucks the king, particularly in the account of Absalom. But, I mean, he, he would do what David asked, but well, he's, uh, Joab's quite a character. Nathan, of course, God's prophet. And then Absalom, this is David's third son. One of the things that comes out in, in this book, and I don't really have anything on this, in, uh, on this in the outline. So look at 2 Samuel chapter 3. And starts in verse 1, of course, there's, so there's contention between the house of Saul and the house of David. There's a struggle for the throne going on according to verse 1. Then you get to verse 2 and you start reading about David's family. Unto David were sons born in Hebron, and his firstborn was Amnon of Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and his second, Chiliab of Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite, and the third, Absalom, the son of Maacah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur, and the fourth, Adonijah, the son of Haggith, and the fifth, Shephatiah, the son of Abital, and the sixth, Ithrium, by Igla, David's wife. These were born to David in Hebron. Well, then you look at verse 13 of 2 Samuel 3, and he's also married to Saul's daughter, Michael. And that's... Uh, and he, By the way, he has more wives than that. But then he has concubines on top of that, and he has all these children, and one of the things that 2 Samuel does is it traces the problems that develop in his family, I would say precisely because of this. I've, this is something I've studied for quite some time, and I just can't wrap my head around eight wives and all these concubines. And of course, we think of Solomon. He's the, you know, he took everything to a whole new level. I just, I can't. Because we know, you know, the Genesis chapter 2, the creation of Adam and Eve, and this is how it should be. A man should leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And then you have all, so you have the first polygamist as recorded in uh, Genesis chapter, it's either 4 or 5, I think it's chapter 5. Lamech, one of the relatives of Noah, he takes two wives. And so very early on in history, you have a departure from what we call a monogamous relationship, one man and one woman. And then you have these characters like David and, and Solomon, of course, and others. They're not the only two, but when you see people like that, their home life is a wreck every time. Okay, well, think about um, uh, Abraham with Sarah and then Sarah giving Abraham Hagar because they hadn't had a child yet. and It never works out. So this, this idea, I don't know, that's just a, that's a study that I'm still working through of So the Bible records a lot of things that God does not approve of. We know that. There's no question about that. And, you know, murder, adultery, drunkenness, you know, that... The Bible records a lot of events like that that God does not approve of. So I would say this is one of those subjects that I'm just not. I would say I haven't figured it out yet completely because. Well, we know God's plan from the beginning. And if you violate God's plan, well. You see the consequences of it in their lives, so that's just something to be thinking about. Uh, because I'm still thinking about it, too, and. I don't know, it's hard, to, it's hard for me to figure out. Anyway, let's look at the key events here. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 2, you have, the, you have David anointed as king in Hebron, but then later in Jerusalem. So again, there's still this struggle between, because Saul has other sons that didn't die with him. And so, of course, they feel they're entitled to the throne, and Saul's household is entitled to the throne. But David was anointed by Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And so that struggle continues to go on between those two. But uh, when you look at 2 Samuel chapter 5, uh, let's see, verse, look at 2 Samuel 5. Somebody read verses 
4 and 5, please. Okay, so he starts out in the southern tribe over Judah, but then it's expanded to all of Israel. You know, at this time, this is what's still called the United Kingdom of Israel. They've not split yet, and that happens after Solomon with his, one of his sons and one of his servants. But while it's still just the nation of Israel, you do have this... There's kind of an overlapping, in other words, between some of these reigns. But David reigns, as you read there in verse 5, for 40 years and 6 months uh, over all Israel and Judah, as it says there at the end. Of it. So that's what this book is about. Another main event here in 2 Samuel, to me, is the account of Uzzah. So you remember the ark, uh, way back in 1 Samuel, was captured in battle, and then it was moved from place to place, and it never, up to this point, it hadn't been returned yet. And so this is one of the things that David is going to do. He's going to get the ark and take it back. And when you look at verse, well, beginning in verse 3, I guess, they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it, out of the, brought it out of the house of Abinadab, who was in Gibeah, and Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. And so they're celebrating. Well, as the ark is proceeding down the road, it's the, the oxen stumble and they shake it. Verse 6. And what's Uzzah do? He reaches out to, to save it. And I, I can get that. I mean, this is the ark of the covenant. We wouldn't want that to fall. Well, your problem here is that so I've got it written in the margin of my Bible. It's not in your outline, but the transportation of the ark, Exodus 25 tells you how to do it, and Numbers chapter 3 tells you who's supposed to do it. it this is not the services of the tabernacle, and, and I mean everything, the services of the tabernacle, the curtains, the instruments inside, the sacrifices, everything is spelled out, as we say, to the letter as to how it's to be done. Well, David does not consult the Lord on how to do this, and here's how we're going to do it, and there are consequences to not consulting God. This is also, by the way, recorded in... Let me turn over just real quick. It's, it's also recorded in First Chronicles chapter 13. So let me go ahead and say this. The book primarily of Second King... Or I'm sorry, Second Samuel and First and Second Kings, those three books, they talk about the history of both the United Kingdom and the Divided Kingdom of both Northern Israel and Southern Israel. First and Second Chronicles only covers southern Israel, Judah. So you have some overlap in these books, but over in First Chronicles chapter 13, you have the, the uh, parallel account here. And, well, listen to this. Just listen to how the book of Chronicles records it. First Chronicles 13 verse 3. Let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. And all the congregation said that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. Well, one of the reasons, one of the reasons that Uzzah was struck dead, other than obviously the fact that the Kohathites weren't handling the ark, and it shouldn't have been on a cart with oxen drawing it. Listen to 1 Chronicles chapter 15 and verse 13. This is um, the response of, well, why has this happened with Uzzah? First Chronicles 15, 13 says, Because ye did it not at the first, the Lord our God made a breach upon us, for that we sought him not after the due order. We didn't do it the way God said do it. And there are always consequences to that. And so whether you're talking about like David's family life or the moving of the ark, when you, don't cons when you don't consult the Lord, it's never a good thing. Especially when He's revealed Himself 
in, in, like I said, Exodus 25, Numbers chapter 3, in such specific detail as to how to handle the ark and who's to handle the ark. And not just the ark of the covenant, but the Kohathites were, it was all the holy things of the temple. And uh, the ark was one of those things. So that's a, to me, when I study 2 Samuel, that's one of the lessons that sticks out to me. If we're going to do something in the name of God, we better have authority to do it. And you find that concept throughout Scripture. Uh, you know, I always think of uh, Nadab and Abihu, Leviticus chapter 10. They offered strange fire which the Lord commanded them not. Well, which implies either he had not yet revealed to them what fire to use or he had revealed it to them and they chose differently. The interesting thing is about that account, so that's Leviticus chapter 10, and it's not till Leviticus chapter 6, 16 that, that we learn about the fire. Now, we don't necessarily know what they knew at that time, but whatever they knew, they did it wrong. And there were consequences for that. So 2 Samuel 6 kind of parallels in that way that you better seek the Lord's will if you're going to do something in His name. Any questions or comments on any of that? Well, and that's what the Lord told him to do. Seek me and you'll find me. Uh, you know, so like you mentioned, Sarah and Hagar. God specifically promised Abraham and Sarah, you will have a son. Now, it took 25 years for that to come to fruition. And so within 10 years, they were getting a little, you know, well, why hasn't God done this yet? So they, they jumped the gun, you might say. So Uzzah and the Ark to me is a, is a main point in the book of 2 Samuel to show us if you're going to do something, you better know how God wants it done. Anybody else? Okay. Number three, God's covenant with David. So David, things are getting established under David as the king. It came to pass, 2 Samuel 7, came to pass when the king sat in his house and the Lord had given him rest about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in the house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. So then the Lord communicates to Nathan, and then of course Nathan comes back and he'll communicate to David. But one of the things that the Lord said was, Have I ever commanded anybody to build me a house? No. Now, they had the tabernacle, you know, for the wilderness wanderings and things like this, but David is forbidden from, of course, building the ark, <laughs> the ark, the uh, temple. And he's told his son, he would have a son who would build a temple, but also in this communication between God and Nathan and David, there's a promise that's given. Look at 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 and 13. Somebody read that for us, please. Okay, now, reading that and understanding the context, we might initially think, well, that's, that's talking about Solomon. And in a sense, it is. But here's the interesting thing. Peter quotes this passage in Acts chapter 2 in reference to the church. This isn't just about the physical temple. This is a spiritual promise to David about the continuation of his throne and the house that would be built. And, uh, you know, Peter, so there on the day of Pentecost... The people are wondering what's going on, and Peter says, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and he quotes Joel. But then when you get down on into the text, he moves on to David and said, this is what was spoken to David, that after he was dead, that the Lord would raise up unto him uh, the Christ to sit on his throne. Well, that was, that was made a reality there in, in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost when the church was established. So it's important to know 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13. Uh, 
And you and I are part of that kingdom today. If you remember the church, you are a part of that. And yet it was promised to David approximately 3,000 years ago that the Lord would do this through his seed. Uh, next one, I've got chapters 11 and 12, Bathsheba and Uriah, and of course David, and of course Nathan is dragged into it, being the prophet. <clears throat> but David and Bathsheba, of course, commit adultery, and she gets pregnant, 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 5, and then beginning, at, David knows what he's done. She, uh, Bathsheba comes to him and tells him, uh, We've got a kid. So David's response is, well, I'll tell you what, let's get Uriah home and I'll send him to the house and we'll try to cover this up. Well, look at 2 Samuel 11. This just kind of speaks to the type of man that Uriah was. David tells him, listen, go, verse 8, 2 Samuel 11, 8, go wash your feet. In other words, clean up, go home, take some time off, relax. Verse 9, but Uriah slept at the door of the king's house. He wouldn't even go to his own house yet. Uh, with all the servants of his Lord, and went not down to his house. And when they told David, saying, Uriah went not down into his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down to thine house? And, you know, we know David's motive here. And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. So that kind of speaks to the character of Uriah, what kind of a man he was. So David's like, well, let's just get him drunk. Maybe that'll do it. And that doesn't do it. And so, all right, let's just kill him. That's quite a story, isn't it? Or not a story. That's quite an account because David, you know, we think of this man, David, well, he's a man after God's own heart. Well, we have to realize when that was spoken of David, because he certainly wasn't a man after God's own heart in this case. He does everything he can do to cover up his sin. And then, ultimately, he has this innocent and honorable man murdered to cover up what he did. Well, you know, who's going to know? He and Bathsheba know. And now... Uriah, who would eventually find out, he's dead. So who? Well, chapter 12. And the Lord said to Nathan, or rather the Lord sent Nathan unto David. And Nathan's got this parable. And so David, again, called this guy in. Hey, take some time off. Didn't work. All right, let's get him drunk. Let's just kill him. Uh, then you have this parable that Nathan tells about this very rich man who has basically everything at his disposal. And this poor man who has one little, one little ewe lamb that he loved. And well, instead of taking out of his own flock, the rich man took this poor man's lamb and sacrificed it. And David's response, um, somebody read 2 Samuel 12, verses 5 and 6. Okay, now this is just a story that Nathan's telling him. And David gets angry, furious. That guy needs to die. And four words, verse 7, Thou art the man. You, you can't hide this stuff from God. You, you cannot deceive God. That's, so, you know, Galatians, I always think of Galatians 6 and verse 7. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. The word mock there in Galatians 6, 7 kind of means you, well, the, the Greek word means you turn the nose up at, but it's kind of like you, you turn your back and try to walk away. That's not going to happen. That will not happen with God. And so God knew, even though David had committed murder and did everything he could within his power to cover it up, so... Now, here's the good thing about David. If, if you want to 
extract something good from this story. Um, look at chapter 12 and verse 13. David said unto Nathan, I have sinned. Well, you've got two psalms written about this. Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. And David talks about how his... One of the, I can't remember if it's Psalm 32 or Psalm 51, but he talks about how his bones grew old inside of him and he couldn't sleep at night and the Lord's hand was heavy upon him. And he's writing about this. And so he does, and I think it's Psalm 51 and verse 5, I acknowledge my sin. That's what you have to do. You can't cover it up. It'll eat you alive. And that's what he's describing in those two chapters of the psalm. It was eating him up inside. And so what do you do with sin? Well, you confess it and you turn away from it. Well, the Lord's put it away and you will not die. But what was the consequence? The child would die. That's one of the consequences. And a perfectly innocent child is going to die here. One of the things that I see here too, though, is... Look at verse, so during the seven days that the child is sick and then the child dies, look at chapter 12 here, verse 22. He said, while the child was yet, he's talking to his servants who told him the the baby died. While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept for I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? And I like that phrase. Well, who can tell? It's kind of the idea of perhaps God will be gracious, but David knew that that was the pronouncement, but he still looked to God's grace. Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me? But then he faces reality. Uh, Verse 23, but now he is dead. Why should I fast? There's nothing you can do now. Can I I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. There are always consequences to sin. Always. Maybe not immediate. I would say this is fairly immediate. Immediate. Maybe not visible to everybody, but there, you can guarantee there are always consequences to sin. And that, those two chapters right there are kind of a uh, main event in the life of David, I would say. Any questions or comments on any of that? All right, number five, Absalom's rebellion. So this is, now Absalom's rebellion is part of the... Uh, Part of the consequences of what David did there, <clears throat> as you keep reading 2 Samuel chapter 12, but uh, Absalom, so Absalom is his third son, so ha- as we have it recorded there in 2 Samuel 3, I think it's his third son of his third wife. And again, his, David's home life is a disaster. I don't know any other appropriate way to describe it, but Absalom steals the heart of the men of Israel. In other words... So that's 2 Samuel 15, verse 6. He is a top-notch politician. Oh, if you guys would come to me with your cases, man, I would do you right. I'd give you justice every time. Well, that's what people want to hear, isn't it? And we see it play out every two years and every four years in our own country. That's exact. I would fight for you. You know, how many years have you guys heard that? (laughs) Been around from politicians. Well, that's exactly what Absalom does. And he revolts. And so from chapters 15 through 18, we have that. And it's not just Absalom. Uh, Absalom takes some of David's people with him. Uh, One of them is a man by the name of Ahithophel, which was one of David's advisors. Well, Absalom takes Ahithophel with him. And uh, David actually writes about that three or four times in the Psalms, about one who was my own familiar friend has lifted up his heel against me. One that I ate with has turned against me. Well... That's talking about Ahithophel. And so uh, 2 Samuel chapters 15 through 18 records that. And of course, it ends in ultimately uh, in the death of his own son. And they're pursuing. And Joab is one of the pursuers of Absalom. And, and you, what did David, do any of you remember what David told them about uh, dealing with Absalom? Anybody remember? Deal gently with the boy. And so as he's fleeing, the text tells us that his head gets caught. He's riding on the back of an animal and his head gets caught in a tree and he's hanging there. And and who's the one that kills him? Joab. And David told Joab. And and it's interesting because the biblical text says everybody 
heard what David said about dealing gently with the boy. And Absalom takes three spears and drives him through his heart and kills him. Uh, and so that's what I was saying earlier about, you know, Joab's one of the main characters, but he is not a quality individual most of the time. So Abs- and, and David's response to... I mean, so Absalom usurps the throne and David flees and leaves Jerusalem. And so as you read those chapters, it's rather, well, look at chapter 16, 2 Samuel 16, beginning in verse 5. You have this guy by the name of Shimei. So David and all of his people are leaving and they've got their heads covered and they're barefooted and they're just trying to get out of town before they die at the hand of Absalom. And this guy by the name of Shimei, he's following the whole way, throwing rocks at him, cursing them kicking up dust. He's making quite a scene. Uh, the whole thing is extremely humiliating, I would say. And uh, again, not only is it Absalom, but it's Ahithophel and other people who were servants of David that betray him, and they betray him for power. And that's, that's chapters 15 through 18. Absalom's death, of course, chapter 18, and David's response to that uh, 2 Samuel 18, verse 32, they come back from the pursuit. The king said unto Cushai, the man that's coming back at the report, is the young man Absalom safe? And Cushai answered, the enemies of my lord the king and all that rise against thee to do thee hurt be as that man is. In other words, I hope they all die. So David knew immediately what that meant. And uh, 1833, And down into chapter 19 and verse 4, you see David's mourning. I mean, this is his son. And even though he's threatened his life and usurped his throne and humiliated him in front of the entire kingdom, it's still his son. And so as you read the end there of chapter 18 and on into chapter 19, you see the, obviously, the emotional reaction of David to the terrible news. And then chapter 24, you've got David's census. And this was one thing that was forbidden. Well, I'll tell you what. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 22. Just a little side information here. You want to read 2 Samuel 22 in the book of Psalms? Read Psalm chapter 18. It's a parallel account. It's the same psalm. And then chapter 23, you have the last words of David, verse 1. And chapter 24, so David... Uh, takes a census, which was forbidden. And I think it has to do with, if you well, if you figure out how many people you've got, you might depend more on those people than you do on God. And so David puts Joab in charge of the census. And what did Joab say to David, though? He said, don't do it. And like I said, Joab is not a good individual. But he, I think he knows you're not supposed to do this. Well, David's word overpowered Joab's, and they do it. And, and once again, there are consequences. But look at 2 Samuel 24, 10. David's heart smote him, the King James says. It condemned him, the New King James says. He's got a conscience problem now. He knew he shouldn't have done this, and he did it. Well, then, of course, you have the consequences And 70,000 people die in Israel over a period of three days from Dan to Beersheba. That's like saying from Canada to Mexico here because of David's sin. 